Water crises show up in society in very unexpected places. And it's happening. People are calling us now where their wells are going dry. One of the things we're going to learn is we're in a much more vulnerable time in terms of how weather affects food production. The reality is that droughts disproportionately impact already stressing communities, already at-risk communities. What's different about this moment in time is this desire to bring everybody along. So you've called it Armageddon, Dune, Mega Drought Denial, Dusty, Permadry, Sisyphus, the Drought of No Return, H2OMG, and even some things we can't repeat here. And we've called it the everything disaster, this hot and arid crisis unfolding in the American West. And have we all named a drought like that, like a hurricane that ravages and then retreats and leaving calm waters? Or is this what is called destiny, the manifest expression of a new climate, the advance of a drying frontier? Or should we even call it a drought? What is the national context, the global ripple effects, and what can we learn, and how can we make society stronger? So I'm Jay Carl Ganter, Director of Circle of Blue and CEO of Vector Center. And this moment marks the intersection of disruption and determination as the American West embodies a pivotal challenge and as a pandemic has revealed weak links in our systems and awakened us to our potential. So a special thanks to our partners at the Pacific Institute, APCO Worldwide, Vector Center, Webit, the Virtual Show, Stockholm International Water Institute, and the UN Food Systems Summit. We're seizing this chance to press forward with what we hope is wisdom, compassion, and some collaboration today. And today we're going to take you on a journey a river of history, of ideas, and imperative responses. And later in the program, we look forward to hearing from you during our question and answer session with our special guests. And be sure to use the Ask the Speakers button on the virtual show screen. You've been incredibly engaged already. We've already received some 600 questions. So, uh, well, let's get started and welcome you and our first voice for water to set the scene. And Sobita Becker is associate attorney with the Navajo Tribal Utility and Utility Authority and Water and Tribes Initiative. What I think is very exciting right now today in 2021 is two things. Yes, we are in a drought and the Navajo Nation is in the epicenter of the mega drought. So we have a lot of people talking about drought, but what's super exciting to me is for the first time in my nearly 20 year career, there are so many people talking about drought and water and wanting to take a holistic approach, an approach that the people that I serve have been asking for forever. So, so preparing for what we could call a new normal, preparing for a world with climate change. Can, can we adapt to a new normal? Um, my, my response to that is normal is changing constantly. And that is, I have to go back to Navajo teachings on this. It is a huge part of our traditional thought is that we are constantly changing from childhood to adulthood to elderly stages. But then even more importantly, our relationships are changing during this whole time period. So does climate change present a new normal or is it just a, is it a focused way of adapting to life on planet earth? Now our focus is turning toward our, our relationship with the natural world. So perhaps the new normal is just shifting the conversation from focusing on our most immediate needs to focusing on longer term needs, focusing on, um, on watching the weather patterns and the climactic changes. But more importantly, it's about ensuring that all people are are treated equitably as we move forward. I think that's what's changed the most. Um, all societies adapt, 
what's different about this moment in time is this desire to bring everybody along. That's what I think is, is a shift. I would argue it's a shift for the older generations. The younger generations are the ones leading the way and demanding that as we talk about climate and we prepare for um, you know, extreme weather patterns, as we prepare for those systems, we make sure that all of human society is brought along. So I'll end with the thought that water is life common refrain all throughout all indigenous communities in the West. And in Navajo, we say to'e'ina. And on that, I will say thank you for listening. And I look forward to any questions or comments that um, you'd like my reaction to. So Bita shared an understanding of change as a natural part of life on earth and of the need to think and act holistically. So from our First Nations and throughout human history, the survival of civilization has been determined by water. And to take us back to the dawn of civilization, we turn to Giulio Boccoletti, author of the forthcoming book, Water, a biography. I'm fascinated by the relationship between water and society. And I wanna take you back to a very important story that took place uh, a long time ago, 3000 years ago. Um, at the very end of the Bronze Age in the 12th century BC. At the time, uh, the Mediterranean was a, a system, a globalized system of trade and commerce. The Hittites, the Egyptians, uh, Ugarit in Syria, these were great states um, that thrived in a commercial and trade system that went from Scandinavia all the way to India. In many ways, it was a small prototype of the modern globalized system. And then it all disappeared. What really unwound the entire system was a migration, a migration from far in the fringes of this system, from the Northern Balkans, where pastoralists who had been living um, a life of subsistence uh, found themselves unable to cope uh, with the loss in precipitation and decided to move. And they started moving down south and they moved towards Anatolia and they took to the roads and they took to the sea uh, and much, much later, these were identified as the Sea People, the Sea People that caused the great collapse of 1177, the great collapse of the Bronze Age. They arrived into the Levant, they destroyed Jericho, they destroyed Ugarit, and they ultimately almost invaded Egypt. And there's a profound lesson uh, in those events for those of us who worry about um, the water crisis that even the West is going through right now. And that lesson is this. Um, the real vulnerability in the face of water scarcity isn't necessarily in the wealthiest or even in those that are suffering the greatest change, but in those that are most vulnerable. That is where an integrated society faces its biggest problems. The story of water and society, the millennial story that started uh, when we first became sedentary 10,000 years ago and decided to stand still in a world of moving water, is a story of institutions, a story of continuous adaptation to the changes uh, in the water environment. And it's full of surprises like the ones of the, of the one of the Bronze Age. Uh, our vulnerability to water changes and to water scarcity and to floods is, is pervasive. It has shaped institutions, political institutions, economic institutions. It shaped even legal institutions. Uh, something we should all know is that you know, the legal systems that we all depend on everywhere in the world have their origin in the Roman legal system, in, this, in, in Roman jurisprudence. And that jurisprudence was shaped, at least in part, uh, by the fact that the Roman system was heavily dependent on the precipitation of the Mediterranean. So water crises show up in society in very unexpected places and through very unexpected institutions. Maybe the most important insight that comes from looking at the history of water uh, over the last uh, millennia, several millennia, is that the last century, the 20th century, is an anomaly, is a particular moment in the history of water and society. And it's a moment in which the West of the United States plays a fundamental role. It is the protagonist of the story of the 20th century because the West of the United States, the conquest of the West of the United States by the great federal institutions like the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers created the archetype modernist project, the way in which a modern industrial society could separate itself from the variability of nature. And it did so 
through the construction of vast infrastructure, uh, like the Hoover Dam, like the American Canal, um, and through the development of agronomic techniques that would allow uh, growing food in deserts, like the ones that we have in the Western United States. Well, what's happening now is that we're finding that a century later, that system is unwinding, that those solutions that were developed in the progressive era and during the New Deal are no longer fit for purpose. So the challenge and the opportunity for America is uh, to find a new project, find a new role for the Republic in the 21st century that can renew that, uh, that uh, constitutional pact, if you will, between the people that live in this extreme environment and the underwriting capability of the federal government. That, to me, is really the, the challenge and the opportunity of the current Western crisis. So from Julio, thoughts on models about how we've managed water through the ages and what we can learn from the changing relationship between the governing state and the landscape. And so that invites a much closer look at what's behind our current focus with a historical overview of water in the American West from the director of research at the Pacific Institute, Heather Cooley. Hey, Heather. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. I'm gonna talk about the history of water in the West because that history shows how some of our past decisions have left us in the challenging situation we now face and can help us chart a path forward. Um, for the first time since the US Drought Monitor was created, more than 95% of the Western United States is in drought. And the drought now gripping the West is having adverse consequences for people and for nature. Um, but these impacts are not evenly distributed. Uh, they're, they're most severe for small and rural communities, many of which have a greater proportion of low-income households um, and communities of color. They're also severe for our rivers and streams that are facing a deadly combination of low flows and high temperatures and poor water quality that are then imperiling salmon and other fish species. But the severity of the drought and its consequences really are a reflection of the region's history. Um, the earliest white explorers brought with them false notions about the abundance of water uh, and a belief they could dominate the land and the water uh, and the indigenous peoples that were here. Western water managers and policy makers then spent more than a century trying to reshape and remold the West into a wetter world to meet the ever growing and ever thirsty needs of farms and cities. The, the federal investments then in massive dams and reservoirs and in long aqueducts moved water from where and when it was available to where and when it was needed. There were also better pumps and seemingly abundant and cheap hydropower that then made it possible to tap aquifers at considerable depths. And all of this was based on false assumptions about the amount of water that was available. The federally subsidized water and then power then fueled population growth in the West and brought improvements in the quality of life and an economic prosperity for some, but it also brought about three of the greatest challenges now facing the region. First, it infueled an insatiable demand for water and a demand that exceeds the available supply. We still see low value water intensive crops like alfalfa that are grown across the West and water use in Western households far exceeds that in other parts of the United States or other industrialized countries. And that's largely due to the watering requirements and the, the large watering requirements for, for grass. That approach also wrought tremendous environmental damage. Nearly every Western river is, is harnessed by dams and diversions. Um, wetlands and other natural ecosystems disappeared. This then caused massive die-offs of migrating birds. Uh, fish populations plummeted. Um, and ecologically, commercially, and culturally valuable species like salmon have been driven to the brink of extinction or lost entirely. The approach also exacerbated social inequities. Massive water projects displaced indigenous communities and failed to provide equitable access to water for health and human uh, needs. Even today, in one of the richest countries in the world, millions of people lack access to water. And for millions more, water is unsafe or unaffordable. 
this problem is especially acute for low income households and black people, indigenous people and other people of color. The severe drought and worsening climate change intensify these challenges. But this crisis also brings with it a greater awareness and it's prompting new ideas and approaches for how to improve water resilience. Some of the areas where I see improvements um, include water efficiency and reuse, urban communities across the West, communities like Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Denver are using less water per person and in some cases less water overall, despite population and economic growth. A growing number of farms are adopting efficient irrigation technologies and practices and without these efforts, this drought would be more severe, but we know more is possible. Ecosystem restoration and nature-based solutions. Um, we're seeing much more integration of nature and natural processes like healthy forests and wetlands into our built environments. Um, those are providing a number of benefits. And provide, finally, there's been a long overdue and much needed effort to advance equity and justice through targeted investments, state programs like California safe and affordable funding for equity and resilience and a growing number of local program, programs. Progress has been made here, but more is needed. The challenges we now face are the result of the decisions in the past, but it's incumbent upon all of us to take actions now for a more sustainable, resilient, and just water future for the West. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Heather, um, for really giving us the context for history. And really, it's history that's being made right now. Um, and it's a story propelled by climate change, a drama that's unfolding in ecosystems all around us and all around the world too. And here to help us understand where we are and what might come next is the President Emeritus of the Pacific Institute and editor of The World's Water, among many, many other things, Peter Glick. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Carl. Good morning to everyone or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. I appreciate the audience joining us for this uh, important topic. We have a lot of great speakers today that are going to lay the foundation for our understanding of the history of water development, the challenges we face in the Western U.S. Uh, expanding on my colleague Heather Cooley's remarks, I'd like to offer some thoughts about where we are today and perhaps where we're going. Let me acknowledge right up front that there's no doubt that the strategies, the technologies, the institutions that we developed in the 19th and 20th centuries to permit the development of the Western U.S. brought great benefits to us. But there's also no doubt that we face a series of unresolved challenges and crises associated with meeting the needs of growing populations and economies in an arid region, and that the approaches we've used in the past are of limited use in meeting the needs of today, much less the challenges that we know are coming. We're approaching or at the point of what I call peak water, the limits of what the natural ecosystem can provide or survive. We might want more water from the Colorado River, but we already take it all. Indeed, we take more than we ought to if we want a healthy river and delta and ecosystem to survive. We might want more water from our already overtapped groundwater systems, but economic and environmental and social costs of diminishing groundwater are rising rapidly. And it's now obvious to any rational observer that groundwater extraction has to decrease, not increase. We have to acknowledge what the indigenous populations here understood a long time ago, that living in balance with the uncertain and variable water resources of the West require a new way of thinking. We're also faced unambiguously now with human caused climate change that's influencing and amplifying the water problems that we face. Some of the most important and distressing impacts of climate change are going to be on water resources through changes in water demands and precipitation, snowfall and snowmelt, extreme events, water quality. Climate change alone should be enough to force us to rethink our water systems because they were built for a climate that no longer exists. What we need is a transition to a more sustainable system a soft path for water. And my colleague, Heather Cooley, hinted at what this means. And here's, here's what it means for me. In the past, what we built in the Western US, we built for water supply, more dams, aqueducts, pipelines, groundwater wells, and we took everything we can. Today, we have to find new sources of water 
that don't don't require stealing from the environment and forcing one segment of society to compete with another. And the good news is that there are new sources of supply in the form of high quality recycled water that are readily available. And we're starting to move forward with this solution. We can capture and use more storm water for high valued uses. If we're willing to address the environmental and economic challenges, we can desalinate brackish and even ocean water. In the past, we assumed that water demands would grow forever with populations and economies. Today, we understand that water efficiency and conservation, that is smart demand management, has enormous potential to cut the amount of water we need to do what we want. We can grow more food with less water. We can wash our clothes, our dishes, ourselves with less water. We can plug the leaks in our system that lose trillions of gallons of high quality water by reinvesting in water infrastructure. These demand side actions are cheaper, faster, and more environmentally sound than any new source of supply. And improved efficiency also cuts the energy needed to supply, treat, and use our water. And it cuts the greenhouse gases associated with our water system. In the past, we didn't understand or know that our water policies would harm the environment. But that excuse doesn't work anymore because we do know Moving forward, we have to protect the environment as a top quality in any a top priority in any sustainable water strategy. In the past, water was considered an economic good to be priced, commodified, and privatized. The soft path recognizes the economic values of water, but also that, val that water is a human right. The failure to provide safe water and sanitation to every human transcends economics. We must meet basic human needs for water as a priority as important as protecting the environment above all other uses. In the past, our water institutions and laws set up to parcel water rights to some but not others or to manage water for industry or agriculture or cities were narrow, rigid, insular organizations meeting the needs of particular constituents with no regard for, or frankly, in direct competition with others. New water institutions are needed that reflect the diversity of our communities, the diversity of priorities that face us, and the voices of the voiceless. Finally, we've rested too long on our laurels, thinking that the water system we built was fine, that it didn't need adjusting or modernizing, or it was too difficult to change because of politics and vested interests. But the drought tells us that we've stopped innovating, we've stopped investing, and the crises of today are the worse for this. If any priorities are to be set for infrastructure investment, water must be at the top. And like many, I'm delighted that the federal government is rethinking investment, but water investment has to be a priority. And the definition of infrastructure, frankly, must be far, far broader than just old style ecosystem destroying concrete. I've described briefly some of the characteristics of the soft path for water. They reflect a different reality today, but they're completely achievable. Components of the soft path are already working around the world in innovative communities that have recognized the limits of past water approaches, as well as the benefits of new, one, new ones. Per capita water use, as Heather mentioned, in California and the West, and frankly, in the U.S. as a whole, is decreasing as efficiency improvements spread. We're starting to see at least some minimum water requirements for some ecosystems, and we're removing the most damaging and dangerous dams. We're beginning to acknowledge the communities that have been left out of past progress and understand that no society can truly be call called civilized if the poorest and most disadvantaged or ignored can still be neglected. Let's learn from the experience of the past and move quickly to build a better future. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Peter. And what a great way to, to uh, get us rolling here, too, and to carry this forward. And we might just have an opportunity to get ahead of history and the tools of technology from real-time satellite data to AI-powered analytics. And they allow us unprecedented foresight in what people believe and what is the actual reality and the ability to share and act more, uh, more quickly on critical data in context and so here to give us an insight into some of what is happening in water data uh, is cody pope the chief innovation officer at vector center 
Here's what's happening now in data in context. We're looking at drought across California and the American West. We're seeing utilities struggling to keep the lights on as fires and drought plague California, triple digit heat waves, new wildfires, and dozens of communities out of water. So how did we get here? Let's step back in time. How did we get from Lake Oroville in 2019 to full to Lake Oroville in 2021 to nearly empty? If you remember back in September of 2020, we were facing some of the worst wildfires California has ever seen. Here is the Sierra National Forest in California, and this is the Marines handling a wildfire back in September of 2020. And if we look at the news and the perception around those wildfires and that the drought that was occurring then, it was considered to be exceptional. California, Oregon, Washington fires are unprecedented, the news read. Death tolls continue to rise, how climate change is fueling wildfires and changing life in the Golden State. This was the context back in 2020. And now we can look at what the data tells us about that context. Here we can see groundwater in August of 2020, and groundwater is an indicator of drought. It's one indicator we can use. In this particular instance, we can see the American Southwest is relatively dry and groundwater is lower than average, and uh, Oregon and Washington State are actually above average in 2020. But moving forward to this exact same time, August of 2021, right now, we can see the entire American West is under severe drought, and we can see that extends up to Canada. So even though the perception was last year that it was the worst season we'd seen in decades, the reality is, is we hadn't even begun to see how bad it could get. Another way to visualize this is the U.S. Drought Monitor, which saw abnormally dry to moderately dry and even severe drought, but not very much extreme or exceptional drought in last year at this time. But now it's nearly all exceptional drought across the American West. So this is the context in which we're looking at where we're going. Now, how are people talking about these droughts and how are they talking about the American West in general? Well, we can look at and track news stories across the globe. And in particular, we can look at California in this instance and see that West LA restaurants are having a hard time procuring fresh produce for their restaurants. There's issues with lobbying groups and environmental protections around groundwater. And there's even water thieves in California right now. The water thieves are around the marijuana industry and they're already illicit and, and, and functioning back channels, but they're stealing more water than they've ever sold before. We can look at other parts of the state and other parts of the same region and see how farmers are coping. In this case, farmers are worried that their water is going to be cut and they want to know what they can do. Is suing the best strategy? How can they maintain their livelihoods under the context of this kind of severe drought? So that's where we are right now. And let's look a little bit into the future. And a little bit in the future, I mean just the fall and coming winter. We all hope for uh, wet conditions to occur, but we're actually going to be seeing the return of a La Nina condition presently, according to NOAA. That's the prediction. And La Nina wouldn't bring much rainwater relief to California South, it would bring some rainwater relief to the northern parts of Washington and Oregon State. So we can actually look at this and see how it's visualized. In this particular case, you can see California will continue to have below average, average rainfall, but you'll see some relief up in the northern states and into Canada. So there is a condition that things will be improving a little bit, but not greatly over the next couple of months. As you can see, another way of looking at this is this predicted water abnormalities from Mar up to March 2022. California remains squarely in the red. You can break it down into sort of uh, three-month forecast blocks. And if you look at the bottom two maps, October through December and January through March, you can see that the conditions are going to return to normal, but we actually need them to return to surplus. So that moderate to severe or extreme, that real deep blue is what we need them to return to in order to build that snowpack and rebuild that groundwater. So what, what we're looking at and what we need to talk about is preparing for a new normal. So the perception that a drought ends, but the reality is, is this isn't going to be a one-off drought and it's not really explicitly going to be a drought. It's going to be new conditions of dryness in the American West for the perceivable future. Now there'll be relief and there'll be seasons of plenty of rain, but we've got to be prepared for a normality where rainwater and snowpack might not be available as a water resource going forward in the American West. Well, thanks, Cody. And as Robert Cray, the blues man, sang, the forecast calls for pain. 
It's important, though, to also account for the human dimensions of water, where pain has been on the map for generations. And Susanna de Anda is the executive director of the Community Water Center and brings her experience to a better understanding of what is problematic and what's also possible. I was raised by farm workers in Salinas, California. And one of the things in our family that was um, really dominant and, and still continues to drive my lifestyle, my, my, my way of thinking is to ensure that as a community, we need to take care of each other. Um, and given that our, my family were farm workers, water, water drove the economy. Um, access to irrigated agriculture, access to farm worker jobs was the local economy in Salinas. And so therefore, my family was very connected to water. But another aha moment for me was when I learned that um, the fairy dust outside during recess time um, wasn't fairy dust, it was pesticide drift. I also was exposed to that. And I just learning about environmental justice in college and relating that into my community and where I grew up really was the driving force for me to say, you know what, that's not okay. We, we deserve better as humans. In California, we have a drinking water crisis. Over 1 million Californians don't have safe drinking water, which means that mothers have to worry that their children don't swallow the water they use to brush their teeth during, in the morning. It means that parents have to ensure that they have alternative water supplies because they can't drink tap water. Many families don't have potable drinking water, so therefore they have to buy alternative water supplies, in essence paying twice for water. It's a constant stressor in people's lives, and the type of water quality that we're faced with is something that no one needs to be exposed to. We're talking about nitrates. We're talking about arsenic. We're talking about 1,2,3-TCP. All these are contaminants that can get you really sick and they're, they have detrimental health impacts on you and your family. These are the same communities that are at risk of losing water completely because of drought impacts. So not only do we already have a population dealing with all, safe drinking water, but it's the same population that's exposed to completely losing water during a drought. And so therefore we need to care. We need to invest in our communities to ensure that everyone has access to water, has access to running water. You know, during the last drought, many families were, didn't trust the phone numbers on who to call to get support. Many families feared um, that their children, if they didn't bathe, that they would get in trouble because they, they, weren't, they weren't bathed to go to school. Listen, no family has to be exposed to that. No one needs to make a decision whether or not their kid can take a shower or not. All families, all human beings need to have this basic necessity met, which means all of us need to have running water. Everyone needs to have running, safe drinking water. However, that's not the reality. The reality is that droughts disproportionately impact already stressing communities, already at-risk communities, many communities that have not had safe drinking water for a decade. And these are the very same communities that I call to action to ensure that our politicians, that our allies, that our agencies are tasked with pri prioritizing resources for our communities that haven't had this basic necessity met. You know, I think the worst case scenario is that wells continue to remain dry, more wells are dry, we're causing land subsidence, we're losing water, and that human suffrage continues. And it's happening. People are calling us now where their wells are going dry, or they're starting to hear the noise of something breaking down. It's too late when things go dry. It's too late when people are afraid to who to call. We haven't done our job right. We can't, we cannot, we don't have the time to waste now. There's plenty of resources right now. You know, Governor Newsom declared a drought emergency this year. There's resources that are tied to drought contingency plans. There's resources already in line to be proactive with tanks and bottled water. And we need to continue to coordinate our communications plan. We need to coordinate our outreach plan. We need to be proactive informing residents on who to call and when to call. And more importantly, we need to be measuring our groundwater levels. We, we're, we cannot afford to do what we did not during the last drought, which is many residents, many familias for months didn't have running water. It's gonna take the collective to ensure that all of our communities across the country have safe drinking water. And I can tell you this, you might live in a very affluent community now. You might have 
maybe potable drinking water now, but that's not gonna be a guarantee forever. So I encourage all of us to be informed on our water quality. I encourage all of us to be mindful of water usage because water is not infinite. And so therefore we need to be mindful of this resource and we need to learn to share it. And we need to make sure that those that have not had that resource have that resource in a timely, respectful manner. So like ancient history, Susanna reminds us that droughts disproportionately affect those who are already the most vulnerable and says the time is now to invest in infrastructure that supports the basic needs of all communities. So along with water, energy powers society and its production is intimately bound with water, especially in the West. And so here to talk about that link and its vulnerability during drought is Sammy Roth, the environmental reporter for the LA, LA Times. Hi, Sammy. Thanks so much for being here today. Hey, yeah, Carl. No, happy to be a part of this. And, um, you know, I specifically focus on energy for the LA Times, uh, energy in California and, and the Western United States. And I mean, I think it's great that you're making energy part of this conversation because there are so many connections between, you know, the energy systems and the water systems that, that make modern society possible, especially in the West. Um, and, you know, what, what I think is relevant for this conversation is that there are ways in which I would say that our, our water challenges that you've all been discussing are making our, our energy and climate challenges harder. But there are also opportunities, um, you know, in, in the water systems and in the ways we need to re rework our, our water and energy systems to sort of you know, have these have these co benefits where solving energy challenges solves water challenges and, and vice versa. I mean, the, the big issue that's, uh, you know, happening right now that's that's being seen across the Western United States is that as there's, uh, you know, less water coming down in the form of, of rain and snow and less water running into reservoirs, a uh, hydropower production is down. Um, you know, hydroelectric power is one of the, you know, the biggest sources of, of energy uh, in, in California and in the West and in the country. It's it's 7% of, of U.S. power production, which is not insignificant. Um, and that's power that is zero emitting, that doesn't contribute to climate change and that, uh, you know, is, is important for transitioning the grid off of fossil fuels, or at least, uh, you know, seems to be playing that role right now. Um, and, and hydropower production is way down. It's, it's, you know, California just released data for 2020, uh, even for last year before the drought got really, really bad over the last few months. Um, In-state hydropower was down like 40 or 45 percent in California over the previous year. Um, you know, there's concerns about Lake Lake Powell, one of the, the two biggest reservoirs in, in the West um, behind Glen Canyon Dam, you know, potentially not being able to generate any hydroelectric power in the next few years if, if reservoir levels fall far enough. Um, Lake Oroville, one of the biggest reservoirs in California, is at risk of, of just shutting down hydro production, uh, you know, in the next month or two, considering how bad things are. Um, you know, so these are these are real serious issues. Um, at the same time, opportunities. I mean, I've read about utility companies and agencies that have actually done an interesting job of um, sort of timing the releases of water from reservoirs to sort of coincide with when the grid is most stressed and in need of power. So as we get more and more solar power on the grid, and in particular, one of the big challenges with, with keeping the lights on, especially in California right now, which is kind of ahead of the game on this, is, you know, how do you keep the lights on after sundown? And thus far, that's been mostly firing up natural gas plants, which contribute to climate change, contribute to air pollution. So they're you know, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting conversations about how do you operate um, water systems, reservoirs in particular to, you know, provide sort of the water services that we need, but also to provide the energy services that we need and at the right time. Um, you know, as, as you know, several of you have discussed, there's been a ton of environmental damage done by, by the building of dams and reservoirs. And, and there have been some, some interesting conversations as well that I've written about uh, sort of negotiations between environmental groups and the hydropower industry over you know, what is what does the future look like? And there was a, a sort of compromise proposal that was put out uh, several months ago that was quite interesting that would involve tearing out, you know, tearing down a lot of the sort of most aging and least efficient dams and some of the most environmentally damaging ones, but, you know, also potentially adding hydropower capacity at the ones that we keep and making them sort of more suitable to generate power, you know, when we need it in ways that are somewhat less environmentally damaging. So I, I think those are really interesting conversations. Um, there are also super interesting proposals that I've, I've written about uh, having to do with something called pumped hydropower, which is this idea of sort of hydroelectricity as energy storage over long periods of time to help 
get us through the periods when when the sun is not shining or the wind's not blowing for you know for longer stretches than than today's lithium ion batteries can handle. Um, you know, I won't go into too much detail on that technology right at this moment. If you're interested, uh, you know, uh, Google it and find my my stories about it. But suffice to say, there are you know, unsurprisingly, environmental controversies with those proposals as well. As well, in terms of the water they would use, would they dam new rivers or canyons? Would they rely on extracting groundwater? So there's you know potential to be very helpful for the the grid there, but also uh, you know some some serious issues involved. Um, you know, another sort of potential solution here between water and energy that I think is really interesting is farmland. Um, there's a lot of controversy right now in the Western United States in particular over the land use of large renewable energy projects. Um, you know, there are all sorts of concerns with if you're building, you know, solar, for instance, in the open desert, how does that affect ecosystems that, you know, otherwise may have been undisturbed? If you're building wind turbines, how does that affect bird species that might be flying through? And one of the most interesting uh, strategies that I've, I've seen for dealing with that is, well, there's all this farmland in California and, you know, we know we have water problems. We know we're, you know, have uh, insufficient supplies to serve the amount of farmland we have now. And, and, and in fact, uh, groundwater is, you know, a critical component of this as, as surface water supplies have dried up. Uh, increasingly, agricultural irrigators in California are pumping more and more water from beneath the ground. And that's, uh, you know, completely unsustainable. And there are state laws dealing with trying to draw that down and, and stop that over pumping. Um, so one of the interesting, you know, solutions there that, that certain developers and, and farmland owners are taking advantage of is, well, take some of that farmland out of production and build solar projects on it, which are very low water use and, you know, would continue to provide, you know, economic benefits to the owners of that land and, and to those communities where the projects are getting built. So that's, you know, has its own challenges, but is something that is is happening in a number of places. And you know, one one more idea I'll raise here is that there's a pretty good amount of research looking at uh, ways that saving water also saves energy. Um, really significant amounts of electricity are used to move water all over California. This you know we've got thousands of miles of aqueducts and extensive pumping systems and. You know, we're pumping water up over mountains and then we're using natural gas to heat water in our homes and businesses in a lot of places. Uh, we're using energy to treat water to drinking water standards. There, there was actually research that came out uh, this year showing that at least in Los Angeles, one of the cheapest ways uh, to save energy and become more energy efficient is actually to use less water, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so again, challenges, opportunities in both directions, and uh, you know, I, I think these are important issues to you know when we talk about water to, to be keeping energy part of the conversation as well. Great, thanks so much, Sammy, and that's really really interesting. I'm really glad you'll be here for the Q and A too. Um, the energy equation is certainly complicated and real, and maybe fundamentally resetting our assumptions about planning for national energy security, as Sammy mentioned. And when reporting on water, we have to talk about the nexus issues that are so closely intertwined. So of course, water, energy, and then there's food. We've touched on that just a bit, but all are essential pillars of an infrastructure that supported life in the American West and around the globe. And to learn more about what a drying frontier could mean for our food future, we turn to Dan Glickman, former US Secretary of Agriculture. What we're facing in the American West is what uh, a lot of areas are facing now in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, uh, where you get three, four years of drought, and then you have a year of just massive excess of rainfall or snowfall. And um, sometimes people think, well, that that excess year means that we're going to be okay, and it, it's just it's just not the case. And it leads to migration patterns. And it leads to a lot of political instability. We haven't seen that in the United States as much as we've seen it in other parts of the world where droughts and, um, and water shortages actually have caused uh, uh, conflict, uh, political conflict to, to, to exist. Um, in the United States, the, 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 the issues relate to the fact that uh, uh, we rely so much on our export markets uh, because we 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 sell about 40% of all the agricultural products that we produce overseas. So if we find other parts of the world suffering like we are, there's going to it's going to be a lot more difficult to sell our products overseas because they won't have the resources to buy them. In many cases the response for policymakers is uh, ad hoc disaster programs or providing money in the event that people actually have losses 
that take place. And that, that happens almost every year. Uh, that's why it's also important that we have uh, policies that provide crop insurance and risk management programs that are flexible for farmers as they deal with some of these uh, uh, unusual weather patterns that can impact their production and cause also impact their, their supply chains. So, um, um, but I go back to this issue that uh, this is both a short-term and a long-term problem. Um, the short-term problem may be a disaster payment, may be a better managed crop insurance program, may be more technical assistance from the land-grant college community. But longer term, we desperately have to find ways to develop crops and that, that use less water. And uh, that would requires a lot of new technologies, uh, genetic engineering, uh, the kinds of things that our research community has been so successful in doing over the last hundred years. But we're really in an emergency now in terms of uh, being able to cope with this challenge, uh, given the nature of agriculture in the West. You know, one other thing I would mention, there actually are a lot of best practices that are taking place all over the country and globally as well. And one of the issues is they're not shared very well. So uh, and, and and so people can't scale them because there, there there's not a kind of an instantaneity of in, in an information flow when it comes to a lot of agricultural practices. And that's something else that I'd like to work on and see us work on is, you know, a lot of the problems. Uh, uh, a lot of farmers at the local level have uh, really have figured this out and an entrepreneur in an entrepreneurial way have figured out how, how to best to handle them w without waiting for the national government to get involved. But sometimes, you know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing and these practices don't get shared. But I think one of the things we're going to learn is, is we're in a much more vulnerable time in terms of how weather affects food production. Uh, so that means a national examination of food supply chains to see if they're, if, you know, they were designed 100 years ago. Are they, are they uh, modern in, in terms of uh, uh, their techniques and orientation? Number two is, is that I, I keep repeating this, but how important it is. We need a massive uh, scale, almost a Manhattan project looking at water utilization in America, how we use it and how we should use it and how we research it. Uh, and that's gonna take an effort of people in agriculture and non-agriculture. It's gonna take people in the environment and conservation, the food industry, food producers, food consumers, and, and the major agribusiness uh, chains uh, to recognize that unless we modernize our food production techniques, uh, we will be more and more vulnerable to these just great changes in weather patterns, which we're going to face for a long time. That's why I constantly go back to this area of research. Um, we 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 do pretty well in terms of food production in America, but we're based on a system of pretty predictable rainfall and weather patterns, and that's just not going to be the way of the future. That's the great challenge, and it needs to be a high-level challenge within our national government. That is. You know, we focus on a lot of things in terms of our country and, you know, the drought is certainly one of them. But in, in my mind, this is an issue that requires a much higher attention at national levels, cross government attention, cross agency attention, because it affects every single American probably more than any other issue we face. So Secretary Glickman points out that agriculture is the sector most vulnerable to water insecurity and stresses the new need for new approaches from a coordinated political will to modernization and the necessary science, research and development, he told me earlier, requires a lot of money and we're going to have to commit to a national, if not global, Manhattan project for water and food, he says, if we're going to have resilient agricultural systems and money on so many levels draws water. So Andre Fouré is the Global Director of Water Sustainability for Anheuser-Busch InBev, and he offers a perspective on how local businesses to global brands can face the kind of water challenges that are grabbing headlines in the American West. So a major drought like that could impact on your direct operations. So if you have a facility uh, in that location, you could physically run out of water. You could find that there's all of a sudden not enough water to dilute uh, the pollution 
uh, in the area. So we could have a quality problem. What could impact on regulatory or reputational uh, damage um, where others are concerned about um, whether you should have access to that water uh, on a preferential basis to produce what you produce? Uh, secondly, it could, of course, also be your supply chain that's disrupted. If you have a major drought that impacts on the commodity that uh, is essential for you, you all of a sudden could have a knock-on effect where either the commodity is not available or the price could increase or there's just a major supply disruption. I think water has come to the fore uh, in this uh, discussion. In the past, there was a very strong focus on just-in-time supply chain uh, efficiency. So how do we make sure uh, that you have the minimum inventory required uh, to produce uh, in, on an optimal basis? But I think we've seen uh, in the agricultural supply chains that disruptions are quite sudden, they're unpredictable, and that it can be quite severe. And they can also impact on multiple markets at the same time. So you may think if I can't produce or can't source from this market, I could always uh, source from another market. Sometimes these droughts have knock-on effects. So all of a sudden, there's a, a, gro a global supply chain uh, crisis. Uh, and we have seen that recently in the COVID situation, just how fragile these supply uh, chains can be. And clearly, water is growing uh, in terms of awareness uh, of how important that could be in managing that effectively uh, in terms of having a resilient supply chain. I can definitely see a more systemic approach uh, towards agriculture, particularly. Uh, and of course, um, the first instance is the importance of how do you manage your own supply chain, so your direct supply chain. So for us, the crops on which we rely on. And we can see evidence of really exciting strategies of working with farmers on better irrigation management. Um, how do you introduce uh, efficiency uh, in the irrigation cycle? Uh, working on soil moisture, improving that watershed investments, uh, etc. And this is a growing trend uh, across the industry. What I think is a more interesting uh, development re more recently is the need for companies like ourselves to invest in agricultural systems where we actually do not have a supply chain. And that is to make sure that we can help contribute to better water availability in that location. So we may have a brewery or a malting plant uh, in that location that is in water stress and agriculture tends to be a major water user from 60 to 70 or even 80 uh, percent of fresh water abstraction in many locations so even though none of those supply chains have direct relevance to us increasingly we find that our watershed projects tend to invest in sustainable uh, agriculture projects uh, such as helping farmers to move from flood to drip irrigation uh, in a range of products to also enhance the yield but it's also essential for us to make sure that once you engage in a project on irrigation management that you don't just displace the water saved from this project to another and to at the same time uh, engage with the local regulatory agencies that that water is actually banked or returned to the environment or maintained in the aquifer and not just allocated to additional uh, agriculture at the same time. We have to start thinking uh, in a more systemic way around water and to make sure that we don't just engage in projects that we traditionally uh, have seen success with or that we think would have um, a reputational value, but that we really have to collaborate with others, particularly with other companies and then with the local uh, authorities to really unpack what are the, water, the, the drivers of water risk in that particular location, and then to direct the scarce resources in terms of dealing with that uh, head on uh, and in a measurable uh, way show impact over time based on the particular issues uh, that have been identified. Well, I am concerned that collective action seems to be much easier to talk about than to do for some reason. We are seeing some examples. I think the Water Resilience Coalition uh, is a very exciting example. Uh, the Beverage Industry Environmental Roundtable, a group of nine companies, competitors, by the way, uh, are collaborating in Guadalajara in Mexico. So there are some really good examples, but these should be by the dozen, not by that that I can count on my one hand. 
So I would call on leaders uh, to go the extra mile on driving collective action. So Andre talks about business approaches that are more systemic, collaborative, and flexible, and about managing watersheds in ways that balance human infrastructure with the natural environment. In a moment, we're going to hear from you, and you've submitted, as I said earlier, hundreds of questions already. And so how do we transform our water future from one of vulnerability, which we've heard a lot about today, to one of resiliency? So much more to talk about. And that's why for our final segment, before we go to your questions, we'll turn again to Peter Glick of the Pacific Institute. Hi again, Peter. Um, how Hi, do we make this transition to a more resilient future? Yeah, thank you. So um, first of all, thank you for hosting this and thanks to the audience for submitting what I, I gather is hundreds of questions. Uh, we've heard snippets from a wonderful diversity of voices and thinkers today um, the, about the concept of resilience, which a number of speakers have touched on. If you work in the environment field or on water or on climate or sustainability, you've probably seen a growing discussion about this idea that is, uh, we need more resilience, but but there is some ambiguity and confused about, confusion about what, what that means. And for the past year, the Pacific Institute has been working on this concept to help us think not just about our long-term goals at the Institute and objectives, but what it really means for the water sector. And what we mean by water resilience is the ability of water systems to function so that nature and people especially the most vulnerable, thrive under shocks or stresses or change. Uh, now, let me unpack that a little bit. So first of all, by water systems and functions, what we mean is the both the natural, but also the built systems that provide the water services that we want, clean water, affordable water, um, uh, high water quality, uh, water for natural ecosystems and, and migrating birds and fishery, fisheries. By shocks and stresses, we mean acute or chronic events and long-term trends such as droughts or floods, which are also a problem, or disease outbreaks as we've seen in the last year and, and year plus. By change, we mean climate change that threatens to undermine our water systems, but also population growth and urbanization and modifications of the landscape. We want our water systems to persist over time. We want them to be adaptable. We want them to be able to transform or evolve to meet new challenges. And finally, we believe that resilient water system must be robust. That means it has to perform reliably under a wide range of conditions during drought, but also floods and other extremes. We want them to be redundant, to have the ability to respond to damage or to take advantage of opportunities. We want our water systems to be flexible. They can alter or adjust themselves in the face of damage or opportunities. We want them to be integrated. Components should be linked and coordinated. Sammy Roth's con uh, conversation about energy is a good point of that. We're not just talking about, about water, but we're talking about energy. We want them to be inclusive, to have tools for broad engagement of diverse communities, including especially the traditionally voiceless or ignored or vulnerable groups. And we want them to be just and equitable to ensure that all stakeholders have a voice to, to have equal access and rights to water services. I could go on expanding our thoughts and definitions and descriptions of water resilience, but there will be a publicly available paper on this soon at the Pacific Institute's website. But instead, I want to reiterate a key point. Under our definition, or frankly, any definition, Water, water systems are not resilient today. Many of them are excellent, providing reliable, high quality water services to many people. But the severe Western drought, along with different kinds of water crises in different places, highlights a serious and widespread lack of resilience. Think for just a minute about what next year is gonna look like if the West is as dry as the past two years. That's certainly possible. We could have a wet year next year, but we could e we're equally likely to have a dry year. California had the most severe five-year drought on record just a few years ago, and we had a six-year drought in the 1990s. The Colorado River Basin has been in drought for two decades, and this year's shortage declaration on the Colorado, which is going to happen in the next week or so, is going to expand if next year is dry. 
If next year is dry, we'll see severely devastated ecosystems, including possible species extinction. More land will have to come out of agricultural production. We'll see more severe fire risk with air quality problems around the entire country, as we're seeing today. More wells will go dry in the Central Valley. Bottled water or trucked water will have to be brought in to provide even the most basic supply in the most vulnerable communities, a problem we already have, as Susanna de Anna, Anda describes so clearly. And these problems are not just drought problems or Western US problems. Think about Flint, Michigan's water crisis, growing water problems in the Great Lakes, flooding in the Southeast, water pollution threats with new contaminants. They all highlight underfunded, poorly managed water systems that are not resilient, not able to function so that people in the environment can thrive under shocks or stresses or change. The current drought highlights the changing nature of our hydrology. Even without climate change, increased stresses of growing populations, urbanization, transformation of our landscapes are shining a spotlight on the need to change our water systems. And when we add in human caused climate change, the need to do these things differently just becomes more glaringly apparent. E.O. Wilson once said something along the lines of, if we have paleo, that, that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology, we can't do much about our Stone Age emotions, to, to be honest. Although the good news there is that deep down, we really care about water. We can certainly do something about our medieval institutions. As for technology, we have what we need to provide clean, affordable water to everyone on the planet. We can certainly protect the environment that's so critical to our own survival. And we can build water systems that are truly resilient. Let's turn the current crisis into action. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Peter. The strong frontier in the American West really does compel us to new levels of response, which require us to know more and to do more and even to be more. It's also in a global context. Water is the UN Sustainable Development Goal, number six, and it's the blue thread that connects basically everything we care about, just like you said. In that spirit, let me turn to someone who has been on the front lines covering water in the West for more than a decade for Circle of Blue, and that's reporter Brett Walton, who will guide the Q&A session. Hey, Brett. Great to see you here. Hey, Carl. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who's joined us on the call and for all of our panelists here on the Q&A. Looks like we have Heather and Peter and Sammy right now. Uh, at the top, Carl mentioned, you know, what do we call this drought? and listed a bunch of names that people submitted on a registration form. Uh, to begin the q and I want to start with kind of the, the biological, physical science of it. So we have a, a common understanding of where we are and where we might be. Some people have called this a mega drought. And people on the registration form are curious about the connections between the dry conditions we're seeing now and climate change, and just the, the basic question of where this drought came from and what we might expect in the next few years. So I guess, Peter, uh, what can you tell us about the, the climate change drought connection and how those are linked? Sure, that's a, a really important question. And, and very simply, look, we have wet years and we have dry years, naturally, even without climate change. The, the hydrology is variable. That's the nature of the, the world we live in. The, what's different now is climate change is influencing these extreme events. It's making our droughts worse. It's making the climate hotter. It's changing the intensity of precipitation events. Uh, when we talk about mega drought, we know through what's called paleoclimatic reconstructions, the ability using scientific evidence to look back at ancient climates, that there have been very long periods of drought in the past, some civilization ending droughts in the past. What we see now is the possibility that we're in a mega drought. We're in a long extended period of extreme dryness. But what's different now is this factor of climate change. And what's different now, of course, is the vulnerability of our own water systems. A thousand years ago, we didn't have the systems we, we have today. And so it's the natural hydrology, it's the climate change on top of it, and it's the vulnerability of our built infrastructure that is the combination of events that is causing the crisis of today. One of the commoner frames today has been that 
things are not designed for the climate of today. And the drought is exposing some of those vulnerabilities. A lot of the questions that people are interested in go along those lines of how do we adapt and how do we change? One that I think is widely shared in the, the comments thread is this question of what are the limits for the West and for cities, communities. We've talked today about all these different pieces of water supply and how they're connected to energy and to agriculture, to cities and ecosystems. So we'll take this question of, of limits piece by piece. And the one question that a lot of people have asked are, what are cities and the limits to cities and urban growth? Is there a point at which the West population can't be sustained? So I guess, Heather, looking at from a city perspective, are there limits to the, the West's urban population? Uh, I would say there are absolutely limits, but we're not there yet. I still see, you know, as I, I mentioned in my comments, we're seeing tremendous improvements in efficiency. Um, we are seeing per capita water use declining and have been seeing that for decades um, due to, to, to standards and codes around appliances and fixtures due to changes in our landscape. So we've made some really important improvements. Um, but we have far to go. We still, when we look at cities in the West, we still see vast expanses of lawn. Um, we still see tremendous amounts of waste, leaky pipes, right? Leaky distribution systems. We still see old and efficient appliances and fixtures. So we've made important progress that has reduced the severity of this drought, frankly, um, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and as, as Sammy pointed out, there are tremendous energy savings associated with that, particularly in our urban areas. We use a lot of energy to move that water, to treat it, to heat it in our homes. And so as we're using less of it, we're saving energy. So there, there is certainly a win-win. Um, circling back though, you know, I think, and, and I mentioned this in my comments, and I think it's important to point out, one of the big drivers of high usage in Western cities is outdoors, is our landscapes. And, and as I noted already, we, we've seen, uh, we still see tremendous amounts of lawn, uh, very water intensive, not appropriate for speaking of bringing things over from Europe and, and even Eastern US where it's more appropriate, um, not appropriate for the, West, the Western US. Um, we've seen increasingly utilities are providing cash incentives um, for people to tear out their lawn and put in more appropriate landscapes that not only save water, but provide other benefits uh, to the community. Um, Las Vegas took a really um, re important step recently in eliminating uh, what they call non-functional turf. So you've seen in street medians, for example, things that no one really uses that are just there for aesthetics. Um, that can't be the aesthetics of our West. Um, so there's some important things that it, and changes we've made and, and some good examples in the West, but we can still do more. In addition, there are opportunities, and Peter talked about this, I mentioned this, reuse opportunities, stormwater capture. You know, we've paved over a lot of recharge areas. We can be capturing more of that water um, and using it to meet our urban needs. And then a, a data point to illustrate that uh, a lot of the Western cities are in a, a wet season, dry season, or warm season, cooler season type of climate. And if you look at a graph of water use in these big cities, it goes like this, where in the winter, there's a baseline use, indoor use, which is pretty flat from November until March or April. And then in the summer, when people start irrigating the lawns, that baseline use can increase three, three and a half times in some of these cities. And I think that's what you're talking about, Heather, is trying to cut down that peak on summer for some of these ornamental lawns. And that frees up a lot of water for these other uses we've been talking about. Uh, Sammy, I wanna bring in you to the conversation here. We mentioned the energy aspect of the drought. Uh, you cover California and I want people to know just how is drought and heat, the combination of the two, adding strain to California's grid and its connection with some of the other Western grids this summer? Um, yeah, it's it's adding a lot of strain. I mean, the uh, the, the number that I've seen from the, the sort of power grid operators in California is that they're expecting to be down like a thousand megawatts of power. Um, I think just from in-state hydropower generation, um, you know, this month and next month, which are the most trying times on the grid. And for context, that's like, roughly on the order of like 
two percent of, of you know peak power demand on the grid in California, a little higher than that. Um, so you know it's not it's not everything, but it's a chunk, and it's one of the factors that they keep citing and explaining why we're at risk of having more rolling blackouts right now. And um, we had two evenings of rolling blackouts last summer, and uh, you know we have less hydropower now than we did then. Um, so you know clearly that's you know affecting emissions, for instance, because it means you got to burn more natural gas. But it, it's definitely affecting the ability to keep the lights on. And this is a big Western issue because California imports something like a quarter of its power from you know other Western states. Uh, you know we get power from Lake Mead, we get power from the Columbia Ridge, River Gorge up in the Pacific Northwest, and so as you know, as it's getting hotter everywhere and electric demand is going up everywhere and, you know, there's less water in these systems, um, you know, right now it's California that that's, you know, looking at this, you know, rolling blackout issue and trying to solve it. But I think pretty soon, especially if other states are, you know, following our lead on trying to phase out fossil fuels, that's going to be, um, you know, an issue to confront everywhere. Yeah, that's an important connection to bring up is the linkages between states in the West with their power grids. We have connections for water systems, Colorado River water traverses beyond its watershed. And in the, the high temperatures we've seen here, a lot of the states that share electrical grids have been challenged in the heat wave. I live in Seattle in the heat wave here in June. Fortunately, there wasn't as high demand in California and some of the electric uh, companies could draw power from California. So that the challenge there is multiple heat waves in multiple areas so that those sharing of resources can take place. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's getting harder because it used to be that you'd have a heat wave in one place or a drought in one place and not another place. And now like, you know, like we're seeing is that, you know, uh, it was mentioned earlier, 95% of the West in drought for the first time. Um, you know, we're also getting these heat waves that are striking everywhere at once, um, which is which is unusual. and. I mean, fire is a part of this too. We've, we've had, you know, as the landscape dries out and it's, you know, easier for these fires to spread, uh, to spread larger and more intense. We've had, you know, issues of power lines getting knocked out um, by fire. And, and, you know, this relates to the hydro because in California last month, we were right on the edge of, of the lights going out and rolling blackouts because of a fire in Oregon that took down a power line coming into California that limited our ability to access that hydropower from up in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, for good reasons and bad, it, it really is all interconnected. And we'll get back to some of those interconnections here a bit later, but I want to bring in our fourth panelist here, Bitta Becker, who I think is connected with us via audio. Hey, Bitta. Hello, how are you? Hi. Uh, earlier, you mentioned on your live segment about something new that you've seen uh, in your drought experience in the West, and that is looking at a, a holistic approach and people recognizing that the old ways may not be suitable anymore. So I was hoping you'd be able to explain and expound on that, what you mean by a holistic approach and what changes you're seeing in this conversation. Sure, thanks. So I think the um, all of the panelists touched on this holistic idea a little bit. So whether we heard from somebody from Anheuser-Busch or from the agriculture community or talking about energy, there's this recognition that water plays an essential role in our entire lives. For I think it's the, specifically what's changing in the conversation is two things. It's the social equity issues, which I think are being highlighted by COVID. And by that, I mean, um, you know, we spend a lot of time today talking about uh, the human need for water. When I started this work 20 years ago, a lot of the focus was on the property right aspect of the water, right? We need water for agriculture, for industry, but there was not a lot of talk about um, the need of human beings needing water to be healthy and sanitary. And I, I'm sure many people watching today know that California has declared water a, a human right, did that just in the last 10 years. So I, I see policymakers and those in charge, and we heard it from the former secretary, wanting to talk about and finding and, and figuring out how do we talk about water as an essential aspect of our being. And a lot of our water resiliency conversation, that's the second area I'm seeing it a lot in, Water resi I mean, water resiliency. And then the third area I'm seeing it in is in a lot of environmental groups are starting to 
ask those questions of themselves. You know, we focused on water for, for the environment, but maybe we need to also include human health. And by doing that, I think we then tie back into some of the issues that Sammy has brought up, um, the connection between water and energy, which by the way, is something the Navajo Nation knows very, very deeply. Um, as Sammy mentioned, a lot of California's power is, comes from outside of the state and, and the Navajo Nation generated power for the city of Los Angeles using a lot of water for, for many decades until that power plant was shut down. Thanks, Brett. Yeah. These connections are something that a lot of the people who have registered and submitted questions are also interested in and interested more in the connections on the social political side. So one question from Barton Alexander from Denver, Colorado, he asked, how do we bridge political divisions to engage divergent interests? And this is perhaps the big question in the West is we have water managed uh, at many levels, federal, state, local. We have all of these different competing needs for water. And we have in this country a, a fairly stark divide in how these resources are viewed. So Heather, Peter, do you have a, a, an idea how those divisions can be divided or bridged? Maybe I'll jump in and then Peter, if you want to add on, um, you know, it's a great question. And I, and I think this is where there may be some positive news in that, you know, when you look at issues around water, and I think Peter mentioned this, people care about water, but we see this across political divides. It's, it's actually one of the less divisive issues um, that we have, and we have a lot of them right now. Um, so it does provide an opportunity to bring people together. People care about water quality. It affects everyone. And in particular, it affects small and rural communities, um, areas that tend to be more Republican. Um, similarly, some of the urban areas, the issues around water and affordability um, are front and center there too. So it's, it's an issue that crosses um, political divides, but too, in terms of what you see in reactions from people, they, they care about water. Um, so I, I do think it's a potential to bring people together to solve these issues um, in, in a time, as I mentioned, where there aren't many of those types of issues. Peter? Oh, yeah, I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, it's, it's a really difficult question. Um, there's an old saying that, you know, you can take almost anything out of water, but the most difficult thing to remove is politics. And in the Western U.S., the systems we built, which were so inappropriate for the hydrology and the natural landscape, are very political. Um, I do agree with Heather, there is good news. People care about water. The other thing about drought, as bad as these droughts have been, is that each drought sort of permits us to have a conversation about one more difficult aspect of this. So we had a severe drought in the 70s, and that was really when the first appliance efficiency standards started to get put in place. And now our water using appliances are much more efficient than they used to be. As Heather mentioned, our per capita water use is going down. Uh, we're, we're getting smarter about the water we're using. And in the 90s, there was another drought and we had a serious conversation for the first time about ecosystems because ecosystems were suffering. And we, we started to think about how can we politically reserve water for natural ecosystems? And then during the last severe five-year drought, in California at least, we got groundwater law, which was a very politically contentious issue and still is not entirely resolved, but we now have, or at least as a result of the, the coming together around that drought, groundwater law to try and bring that into the system. Now we're having a conversation that we should have again had for a long time about the failure to meet basic needs for, for native, community, native Indian communities and indigenous communities and disadvantaged communities, the populations in the Central Valley of farm workers that don't have access to safe water. We're, we're having that political conversation. And so there is an opportunity. These droughts do raise the potential for addressing difficult political issues. And I'm hoping that we can resolve some of the remaining unresolved political challenges, for example, around water rights. That's another challenge we still have to address. Yeah, we'll get to water rights here in a little bit. And I'll bring in Sammy for the energy component of this in a second. But you're mentioning of uh, securing water for tribes and indigenous communities, Peter, uh, is a good chance to bring in a bit to Becker here with a discussion of the Water and Tribes Initiative 
that the federal government uh, is involved in, along with many of the tribes in the Colorado River Basin. So, but Dick, can you explain just a bit about what this initiative is and what it hopes to achieve? Yeah, thanks. So the Water and Tribes Initiative was started by uh, Professor Matt McKinney of University of Montana and Daryl V. Hill, the water um, manager for the Hickory Apache Nation. They started the Water and Tribes Initiative to create a platform for the 30 tribes in the Colorado River Basin to raise their collective voice, the tribal voice, specifically with the federal government and related to the upcoming renegotiations of the what we call the interim guidelines. So how the, the Colorado River is managed, mainly Lake Powell, Lake Mead, um, how those two huge reservoirs are managed. Um, so this was started pre-pandemic. And then during because of the pandemic, um, uh, Ann Castle, a former uh, Obama official, uh, and I began this initiative call, be, called um, Universal Access to Clean Drinking Water. Because as, as Peter mentioned, uh, there and Heather and others and Sandra very eloquently. It's surprising to many people to learn that over 2 million people, and I suspect the number is higher than that, in this country lack access to clean drinking water. And the pandemic shined a light on this issue and, and have left a lot of people scratching their heads asking how do we solve it. Um, so Ann Castle and I started this initiative and uh, very happy to report that the federal government, that the Senate, and we hope, fingers crossed the Congress, is responding with uh, significant funds, significant federal funding to address the infrastructure needs. And I'm digressing a little bit because I do wanna go back to the question about divide in this country. One of the reasons um, some of us practice water law is because it's one of the few areas where the right, the Republicans and the Democrats do come together. Uh, as we've seen in the most recent bipartisan infrastructure plan from last week, where billion, tens, upon, tens upon tens upon billions of dollars is being identified for water needs. So there is hope, there is hope. I, I, I like to think it's because we are, we are made of water. We live on the blue planet. You know, there's a mind body connection and these moments in time that we're in, and it was said earlier, you know, we're in a crisis with the drought and we are in the crisis with COVID-19. And as and many successful politicians have said, um, never let a good crisis go to waste. So, so that I'm digressing a little bit, but I'll, it's hard to talk about any of these issues in isolation because they all, they all push on each other. So the Water and Tribes Initiative is meant to elevate the tribal voices in the basin in a highly technical, highly regulated environment um, because that's the world that we've created in, in not just the United States, but across the world, a highly bureaucratic world. And all the people on this webinar today are helping to deconstruct that to, to bring more people into this conversation around water. You mentioned the the attempts in the Senate and the House to provide more funding for water infrastructure for Native communities and Navajo Nation. Water infrastructure can be sort of abstract. Can you tell us what that would mean for Navajo Nation if some of those funds were available and what infrastructure is needed on the reservation? Sure. So it's estimated that 30 to 40 percent of the homes on the Navajo Nation lack, lack pipes to their homes. Um, so this funding would help uh, get clean drinking water piped to people's homes. It would also help to increase wastewater facilities. So when thinking about water, it's always important to think water in, water out. Because when you bring clean drinking water in, you have to get, um, ex you know, dispose of the, um, the dirty water. And, and that was made reference to earlier. And what I do want to point out is something that Peter said before, which I think is probably pretty interesting to people listening, but we are also building a project off of the San Juan River. And that is that project was first proposed in the 1950s, and it's finally being constructed now, and I won't go into all of that history. But the reason I highlight it is it's seen as a drought mitigation tool. 
because it's taking surface water and relieving the pressure off of our groundwater supplies. So the infrastructure is, and the last reason I raise this is because the infrastructure, the question is what will the infrastructure look like? It has to be site specific. And as we, as we move forward in this conversation, um, whatever solutions we come up with to, to create water resiliency, what people will learn is there each one is unique to the community you're in. Um, whether, whether it's based on the hydrology, the climate, the, the landscape or the politics, e- each system will, will need to meet the, the people and the region, the natural environment that it's serving. Thanks, Bitta. Sure. And then turning now to Sammy for the, the energy angle on this question about political divisions and engaging divergent interests. California is trying, like many states and countries, to transition to clean energy. Uh, I think Governor Newsom has uh, put forward a 100% clean energy goal. And the governor just put out an emergency order uh, for energy to get the state through this summer with as few uh, blackouts as possible. In building out that energy transition, uh, where are the, the divisions, Sammy? Well, gee, um, I mean, I think one place to start is that even in California, this is still something that's, you know, politically difficult and at, at times perilous. I mean, yeah, we, we do have a 100%, uh, you know, uh, zero carbon electricity goal that, that's actually, uh, you know, signed into law and, and even predates Governor Newsom. So that's been on the books in California for a while. And, and you know, it's a state that's controlled largely by by Democrats, pretty much, you know, uh, at, at every statewide lever of power. So you'd You'd think maybe this would be something that's uh, you know that's that's easy here, um, but it's uh, but it's not. I mean, when we have this situation where it's getting harder to keep the lights on, I mean, there's no politician that wants to be the one who presides over you know a state that that can't keep people's refrigerators powered or air conditions turned on during a heat wave. So yeah, Governor Newsom has you know issued orders that allow for more use of diesel backup generators and made it easier for. You know, him and his appointees for natural gas plants to to generate more electricity when the grid is at times of stress. Um, you know, we've got all sorts of other issues in in the state of California politically. I mean, it's still a big oil producing state, so where there you know fights happening right now over should we stop issuing fracking permits or not? And you know, there there are all sorts of jobs associated still with uh, with oil refineries on the coasts and with these gas plants and with with these extractive activities. But you know, I, I think. Um, especially when you, I'm trying to relate this to the water conversation a, a, a little bit. I mean, I, I think that it's similar in that there are paths forward that would, you know, theoretically benefit everybody. I mean, when you look at the, you know, the proposals that are out there for, you know, the number of clean energy jobs that could be created, or when you look at, I mentioned earlier in my, you know, my remarks, this um, you know, this this agreement between environmental groups and hydropower dam operators of, you know, what kind of funding they want to see from Congress. Um, I mean, there are definitely opportunities in both of these spaces, uh, you know, to spend, you know, lots of money in ways that, you know, creates, creates jobs in clean energy, creates jobs, you know, fixing up old dams, uh, you know, tearing out dams that are especially damaging, you um, you know, there are ways to do it that thread all of those needles, but when you've got people who have vested interests, whether that's a fossil fuel job or, you know, an irrigation district or, you know, a, you know, a, a, the Bureau of Reclamation, which are the Army Corps of Engineers, which is super focused on, on flood control still and, you know, is nervous about doing anything differently in terms of how it operates a water system or an energy system, um, you know, it, it's always hard to overcome those kinds of vested interests and, and biases, especially when people have, uh, you know, have money on the line. Okay. Thanks, Sammy. I think, Peter, you had something you wanted to chime in with? You need to be unmuted, Peter. Sorry about that. Uh, I've only been doing this for a year and a half, like all of us. Sometimes forget to push the right button. Um, an important uh, thought about the energy water combination One way to think about this is we don't want to use energy or water. We want certain benefits. We want air conditioning. We want cold preserved food in our refrigerator. We want clean clothes and clean dishes and and we want to get rid of our wastes. If we can do those things with less energy or less water than we're currently using, that's a benefit to us. And that's the idea of energy or water conservation and efficiency. If we can do those things with cleaner versions of energy and water, 
That's the idea of moving toward more sustainability and reducing greenhouse gas emissions or reducing impacts on ecosystems. And so we have to get away from the fights of how do we get more water? How do we get more energy? Um, how do we fight over fossil fuels versus renewables? Let's provide the benefits that we want as cleanly and as efficiently as possible. And that's a good way to combine the energy and the water conversation. All right. If I could just uh, respond for, for one yeah. second to that. I mean, I, and I don't mean to be too much of a downer here because I, I think what, what Peter is saying is correct, but I mean, there's, there's the sort of logical way of looking at it of, yes, we want, you know, really what we want are the benefits from these things and we should be able to get around, um, you know, get around conversations about the way things have traditionally been done as long as we get, you know, the, the benefits and the lifestyles that we want. But I mean, the really tricky thing sometimes is just, especially now in 2021, so much of this has just become tied to people's political ideologies and identities in a way where it can be difficult to have rational conversations. I mean, you, you drive up and down the length of California, you will see in the Central Valley everywhere, the recall and loosen signs are right next to the build more damn storage signs. Uh, I mean, these, and, and it makes me think of, you know, you go to, a, I haven't spent much time in West Virginia, but it makes me think of, you know, this idea that even if coal jobs, you know, aren't, you know, especially prevalent anymore in a lot of these places, coal has sort of become part of their identity and protecting coal has become, you know, something that's tied up in, in how people see themselves um, socially and politically. And I think that the same thing happens with water in a lot of cases in California and elsewhere. So I, I may think that it's important that when we talk about these solutions, it, it's never just going to be enough to say, well, this is going to work out for everyone and we're still going to, you know, we're still going to have power and we're still going to have, uh, you know, landscapes that we like and we're still going to have water. Like you really do need to get, I think, at the, you know, the, the social and somewhat psychological uh, part of it that, that people might not be persuaded by, you know, by logic or reason all of the time. Well said. Um, you see those divisions come out every floor speech in Congress of you know, people latch on to identities and identities and physical objects. Another big contributor for this water energy nexus is with food and agriculture, which is a topic we haven't broached yet, but there's some interest uh, people who have written in with questions. Uh, this one comes from Nadi Barak of Israel, and it catches the, the gist of what a lot of people are asking, and that's California's agriculture is a large part of US and global agriculture. So how can we assure its sustainability in these times of drought and water scarcity? So Heather, you wanna take a first shot at that? Yes, um, happy to do that. And a great question, an important question, um, the connections between water and food security um, are, are, are critical. Um, you know, I think we can look to California uh, for both good things and, and bad things. <laughs> um, there we are seeing and have seen a big transition towards um, more efficient irrigation technology. So moving away from flood irrigation towards drip irrigation, um, we're seeing a big shift in the types of crops that we are growing from some lower value water intensive to higher value crops, some that are still relatively water intensive. Um, but they're certainly generating at least more value for the water that, that we are using. Um, there's new scheduling technologies and techniques that are being applied. So we're seeing lots of great um, innovation happening, the things that can spread to other regions. Um, but I think the reality in California, and I, as Sammy talked, uh, touched on this, is that we are we have too much agriculture. Um, and as we look and we have been drawing on uh, groundwater, particularly during droughts, um, we have been overdrafting groundwater. And so, uh, and with some of the legislation, and again, Peter mentioned this, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that was passed during the last drought, we are going to have to draw less water from groundwater. There are absolutely opportunities to be capturing some of those wet winter flows um, and putting them underground. And there's a lot of innovation in happening around that. And again, lots of opportunity, but the reality is some land's gonna need to come out of production. And so that needs to be driven and, and prompt a conversation. And it is prompting a conversation about how do we have sustainable communities? Um, where are there energy opportunities for areas coming out of, of agriculture, for farming? Um, what are job opportunity, local job opportunities for farm workers um, that would be impacted? So 
there, I think are many lessons and models um, in California and in other parts of the world. Frankly, Israel is a great example, um, but we still have a long way to go to be more sustainable and resilient in, in agriculture. And agriculture leads into the next question, which is on water rights. And a lot of the Western states have a water rights system that has been in place since the 19th century. And a lot of the irrigation areas have oldest rights and the largest rights. On the Colorado River system, it's the Imperial Irrigation District that has the largest number of rights to that water. So we have a question here uh, from Betsy Otto of the World Resources Institute about water rights and about reforming this system. So she says, can federal or state authorities step in and change prior appropriation rights or do we have to rely on market mechanisms or other ad hoc types of systems? So Peter, is that something that you could address? Oh, Brett, I was afraid you were gonna ask me. <laughs> um, so water rights is, is in my opinion, the, the most difficult unresolved challenge of the, of the 21st century for the West. We have 20th century water rights or frankly 19th century water rights and institutions. And um, th they served us reasonably well, but, but that system is not, in my opinion, working well anymore. And of course it was developed at a time when we didn't think about ecosystems at all. Ecosystems have no rights to water under the water rights sy sy system. Uh, more modern, more recent communities have no, no rights under those systems. So there does need to be some sort of reform of the water rights system. Uh, we've given away more water in paper rights than actually exists in real, real water. Everybody understands that um, during a drought, uh, junior water right holders don't get much water, if any. And now just this week, California announced serious cutbacks to senior water rights holders in order to protect water quality for, for some cities that's, that are, that's now threatened because of the drought. Um, I honestly don't know, maybe somebody, somebody else on, on, the, on the group here has a better idea. I don't know how we're gonna get to that issue. Um, I do hope that there will be reform in the water rights system. The State Water Resources Control Board has the ability to try and modify some of that. I do think some sort of market approaches could be helpful, but market approaches have, have flaws as well. You know, ecosystems don't have money to buy water rights, to buy water in a market system. Disadvantaged communities are typically excluded from water markets in a purely economic sense. These are the difficult challenges that we have to face, but I, I agree with Betsy's question, the water rights sy system has to be reformed. Well, see, yeah. Uh, Bitta, do you have something you want to add? You are a lawyer and have worked with the Division of Natural Resources at the Navajo Nation. Water rights, how how do you see them playing out in the future? Yeah, um, so I, I can jump in a little bit. As Peter said, it is it is it is challenging. But let, let me point out some rays of hope. So over the years, many states in the West. So to to the question state legislatures can define the law, right? And they define the law of their states. So I last I checked, all states except one in the West had defined in-stream flow rights as being um, part of the water right. And so what that means is that you can leave water in the river. That is, that is definitely a, an advancement because the original concept be behind Western water rights was use it or lose it, meaning every single drop of water had to be put to use. And when I started this business 20 years ago, whenever I drove over a stream that had water in it, um, my, my then supervisor would say, I can't believe there's a drop of water in it. <laughs> Why aren't they putting it to use? So you do see, you do see society, you know, shifting and, and adjusting. But it is tough for the reasons that Sammy said to change laws, either political ideology or uh, the costs that are sunk into these systems, right? That's, th this is where I, now I start to get a very 
an easy ground because I've often thought the issue is tr- just, it's a money issue. And by money, I don't mean just providing money, but I mean, what money values? And is there a way to, for money to not value the pumping up of water? So a little, the reason I'm saying it that way is one of the things people always say in the water business is money flows up, uh, water flows uphill to money, right? Um, and, and I don't, and I just want to t- talk about the, I just want to answer the question because I could spend a lot of time talking about the challenges of the legal water rights system for Indian tribes who Peter kind of hinted at this, which is that although tribal people have been here forever, long before the states were created, long before the United States were created, we, we have legal rights to water, but what's, what we, what some tribes have never been able to get, our tribal rights are incomplete, meaning we don't know the quantity of water that we have. So people, Peter had used this term that there's a paper right to water, but that doesn't mean you practically use it for, for too many tribes in the, in the West and particularly in the Colorado River Basin. We don't even have the full paper water to write, uh, the, the full right on paper because we still have, we have to figure out what the quantification of that water right is. So you imagine all of that legal, that legal construct against the backdrop of drought, and it does get very, very complicated. Um, but where's the ray of hope in this? As I, as I said, um, more state legislators are recognizing in-stream flow rights. And again, I have to keep going back to the pandemic where our young people are really forcing us to think differently, think differently. And those young people will be lawmakers. It's tough because sometimes we won't see these things in our lifetime, but hopefully we're all, you know, helping our kids grow and, and help us become um, better, better at what we do. Yeah. We could organize an entire session just on water rights in the West and would be incredibly nuanced and interesting. And maybe it's something to, take in mind for future future panels yeah, and then idea. the other thing is that water water rights lawyers are almost guaranteed full employment for their lifetime some of these adjudications can take 30 or 40 years as some of the new mexico adjudication show so we'll leave the water rights uh it is a complex and, and daunting challenge to say the least in every state because every state has different laws and different rules and layer on federal and reserved rights for tribes We've talked a lot about opportunities and challenges, and I want to put some concrete examples to the the ideas that we put out there. Um, so each of you, I'll go in turn. Do you have an example project or development or area city, something that shows the potential for a new way of living with drought in the West, not just in the West, in the the Great Plains, in the Upper Midwest, in Australia? Israel, anywhere that we have these water challenges, but can you point to a place that is doing it well, that has made changes, investments, uh, social change, ecological, ecological change, so some change that uh, you think has been beneficial and would be a good example? So I guess start with Peter. Yeah, so there are lots of examples of success, what we think of as success stories. Um, you know, we've heard bits and pieces of them from each of the speakers today. Um, I, I would say nowhere is doing everything right necessarily, but the components of what I think of as a soft path, the, the better technology, the better demand management, the new way of thinking about supply, the new way of thinking about economics. I think we see examples of that all over the place. In California, you know, the, the slow trend toward increased reuse of high quality treated wastewater is a trend that we've seen already in Singapore around the world and in Israel and in Namibia for 30 years. We're, we're, it's a new source of supply. You know, we used to collect wastewater and treat it to a pretty high standard and then we'd throw it away. We dump it into the ocean. That's, a, that's an asset. It's not a liability as we've, we've been trying to describe for many years. And more and more now we're turning to the realization that highly treated wastewater, which we can treat to incredibly high standards, is a source of supply that's relatively drought proof, um, that doesn't require taking more water out of ecosystems, that, that doesn't require uh, draining more groundwater. So, th- so I would point to that as a, a success story. 
And I hope that just one more example, we're slowly seeing a change in the mentality about outdoor landscape. Uh, Heather mentioned we brought from the Eastern US, which brought from Europe, this idea of a green lawn as the right kind of landscape in our homes. Um, well, that's crazy in an arid, arid region. We use way too much unsustainable water for land, outdoor landscapes and lawns in particular. Um, that's got to change. And, you know, we don't smoke on airplanes anymore. Uh, there are lots of things that we don't do that we used to do without thinking about it. And maybe someday lawns will be in that category. All right. Heather? Yeah, so great question. And I think there are a lot of great models um, within the U.S. and outside. I'll talk maybe Peter touched a little bit on some of the international examples. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some that I see um, in the United States. Um, I, I've been really intrigued um, and uh, and at Los, what Los Angeles has been doing and some of the goals it's been setting for itself. Obviously, a city that's been very heavily reliant uh, on imported water. Um, of course, movies have been made, lots of stories, um, uh, you know, on that history. Uh, but, you know, they have been, uh, commit, they have committed to reducing reliance on imported water, at least some of their imported water. Um, they've, they're advancing efficiency. Efficiency is part of their goal in getting at that. They have a goal to recycle 100% of their wastewater. They're making investments in stormwater. And yes, this is in Los Angeles in an area that's an arid area, but it does get intense rainfall events. So lots of really interesting things, I think, happening there. Um, I, I often look to what Seattle has done, frankly, with respect to its rate structures and its um, affordability programs and its social equity emphasis, lots of good examples. And we're seeing more, fortunately, seeing more of that um, in, in some of the large urban cities um, across, the, across the United States. Um, I, I mentioned Las Vegas, but I think it does deserve a mention that, you know, they really were among the first, if not the first, to provide the sort of cash for grass, the incentives for removing lawn. They have a lot of it there. Um, it's very water intensive. But as I mentioned, you know, their, um, their step to uh, get rid of this non-functional turf, the, the, the things that no one steps on, I think that is, in, is important. Um, I, and I think other Western cities, um, frankly, and other places should be rushing out and copying this. Um, I, I think it's a great model and, and is an important step towards making us more sustainable and resilient. Sammy, you live in Los Angeles. How do you just see the, the LA changes? Are they uh, accepted, embraced by city leaders, by the public? And for the energy side, what sorts of energy water uh, transitions are, are, are going on? No, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, what, what Heather said is, is definitely accurate, that there's a, a pretty significant and pretty um, widely accepted push in, in LA at this point to cut down significantly on some of these wasteful uses. I mean, there was a, um, you know, Peter as well mentioned, uh, you know, wastewater reuse, um, and there was a pretty significant ballot measure that, that passed in LA a couple of years ago with, with overwhelming support from voters of people basically agreeing to tax themselves to um, pay for those types of projects. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I recall. I'm, I'm an energy person, not a, a water person. Um, one thing I will say about that, just to complicate things before we, we close here, is that um, a lot of the wastewater that is currently not reused in Los Angeles is actually discharged into the Los Angeles River and other uh, local streams and tributaries that have been uh, concretized uh, over the, the decades and actually are one of the main sources of water in those uh, those rivers at this point. Um, so I think there's also an interesting question about if we're reusing water, that, that might be great from a water efficiency standpoint, but there are also questions about what it means for the ecosystem surrounding those waterways. Um, another conversation for another time. Um, you know, one, one example that I would point to in the energy space and the water space, it's interesting. I, I spoke earlier about this potential for converting uh, farmland to, to solar power with which, you know, Heather expanded on a little as well. Um, I, I just wrote recently, I was up at this project site in the in the San Joaquin Valley, um, about halfway between LA and, and San Francisco, where there's a, a company that's currently in the process of building what could ultimately be one of the, the largest uh, solar projects, not just in the United States, but um, but in the world, they've got 20,000 acres up there that they're, uh, you know, that they've permitted for solar. Um, it's an area where groundwater has been significantly, you know, over pumped where you have land subsidence, the land actually sinking because of all of the water that's been pulled out. Um, and it's especially interesting because these are lands that are known as drainage impaired, which 
again, I'm not a, a water person, but basically, as I understand, it means that the the water that they use to irrigate those farmlands doesn't filter down, uh, you know, into the soil and into the ground very well. It, it gets stuck. Uh, salts that are bad for crops kind of build up in the soil. They dumped a lot of this water, which was toxic for a long time in a wildlife refuge, which uh, not surprisingly in retrospect didn't work out too well. Um, so there's been all this effort to figure out what do you do with all these drainage impaired lands where there's this uh, this subsidence and you know, right now it's looking like a, a big chunk of those are going to be converted to, to solar to help power, you know, the Bay Area, power Southern California. And again, not my job as a reporter to endorse a particular project. I'm sure there, you know, uh, I mean, there, there are folks who don't want to see farmland uh, converted to solar, who want to see agricultural economies endure. But it's it's definitely an interesting example of the types of intersectional stuff we're, we're talking about. It's known as Westland Solar Park. Thanks. And uh, Bitta, what changes do you see happening in the Navajo lands and Colorado River Basin? Yeah, sure. So I, I, a couple of things. So the question is, what do we see changing? What I really want to emphasize is that we're products of our history, right? So we, we do things maybe because we don't really know why we do things, because, but because something in the past um, led us to doing it. So I wanted to talk about a governance structure approach along the San Juan River. So the San Juan River is located in Northwest New Mexico. It is the largest surface supply in the entire state of New Mexico. By and large, the state of New Mexico relies on the Rio Grande River. Um, but a lot, and this San Juan River flows into the Colorado River. Many, many uh, I think it was nearly 20 years ago, um, the users along that river, which include Indian and non-Indian people, were agreeing to shortage sharing uh, agreements. So long before the you know the mega drought, long before what we're talking about, they were already they were already as a governance issue. They being these individuals were coming together, and I would argue um, probably against the weight of history, right? Against the weight of the history that we've been talking about all, all, all morning slash afternoon, wherever you are, midnight, wherever you are listening. And the reason I want to go back to this is because we've spent a lot of time talking about agriculture. And as, as Sunny said, you know, move, changing farmland to solar may not be popular among everybody. But I, one of the reasons I would argue we, we are talking about agriculture is because of the Jeffersonian, Thomas Jeffersonian ideas of what it means to put land to use. So, so all I'm suggesting is, I think what happened along the San Juan River was, was quite um, progressive for its time, totally slid under the radar because it's such a small rural community, nobody was talking about it. But I'm pointing those things out because people, maybe what I'm suggesting is it's easier for people to come together um, when the spotlight is not shine, shining on them, but when it's just people working together. And I, what I had, the image I have in my mind is a bunch of sort of bureaucrats who see what's coming down the pike and recognize, um, okay, we've got, you know, let's prepare for this. And we've been, we being the Navajo Nation and other entities along the San Juan River have been entering into the shortage sharing agreement every year for 20 some years. And, and to me, that's very hopeful because um, it is, it arguably could be in many people's economic interest to not enter into those agreements, right? But the health of the river is what's so important. And the other thing that's happening along the backdrop of the San Juan River is there are very good environmental protection programs that are happening where the NGOs are working with state, federal, and tribal governments. So, so there are many reasons to be hopeful. And, and I just want to reemphasize everything Heather said. Water use is going down in our urban communities. That's tremendous. I remember being at a conference once and somebody saying, water is the only business in the world where we increase our prices and decrease our supply. Um, but people in Las Vegas and in Los Angeles, they're going along with it. But, so we're, we're seeing significant shift. That's a pretty good coda for the conversation. Significant shifts are happening in climate and in our responses to this changing world. Now, I've called the, the drought is an everything story and we've seen that today, certainly. It, 
affects everything from agriculture to human use, to wildlife, to energy production. And it's going to be a challenge in the coming months. Uh, so I want to thank Heather Cooley, Peter Glick, Sammy Roth, and Bitta Becker for being on our panel. And I'll hand it to Carl for a wrap up. Great. Thanks so much, Brett. And thanks to all of you for such thoughtful questions and so many names for what might be called a drought or a new normal. And so many other facets from finance to technology that we barely touch today. So like we said, we can do a lot more of this. And this is a moment of relevancy for the world's water from supplying our cities and growing our food to the most basic human rights and environmental sustainability. And Sir David Attenborough said, saving our planet is now a communications challenge. And that means persistence. And that incremental is not an option when telling this story. And this is the dramatic story of our history, as we just heard, and our future. And so I'd like to thank all of our guests, and that's Bitta Becker, Giulio Boccoletti, Heather Cooley, Peter Glick, Cody Pope, Susanna Danda, and Sammy Roth, and Dan Glickman, and Andre Foray. And special thanks for making this possible behind the scenes. A lot of folks here, Brett Walton, Laura Hurd, Connor Bebb and Matt Welch and Jane Johnston and Eileen Ray McCann. And a special thanks to to Plum and Rusev of the Webb Foundation who made hosting on the virtual show possible. That's the platform you've been watching and the producers behind the scenes there too. And thanks too to our friends at the Pacific Institute and APCO Worldwide and Vector Center and the Webb Foundation and the UN Food Systems Dialogue and the Stockholm International Water Institute. And we'll also let you know when the session's posted online, and we'll share links to more resources. And for more water news and analysis, I encourage you to visit Circle of Blue and the Pacific Institute and the Stockholm Water Institute. Like I said, we'll share a lot more resources because this is a story that's going to be very persistent, and we want you to keep informed and be involved. So thanks again for being with us. I'm J. Carl Ganter. <laughs>